Rupert, do you want to ask your question to Don about that structure beyond space time? Yes, it was. If if what I've just said is is true, if 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 Don, you feel that what I've just said is true, that our faculties of thinking and perceiving impose or render reality as time and space, then with what faculty are we able to explore this um, the the dimensions that lie between time and space and if you go all the way back dimensionless consciousness but what you're suggesting is that there are structures in between time and space before you get all the way back to dimensionless consciousness we we have di- I, I would suggest we have access to time and space through our thinking and perceiving faculties access to the ultimate reality through the pure awareness of being but with what faculty are we able to access the regions behind time and space and in front of infinite consciousness, so, so to speak. Right. I, I love the description you just gave, by the way. It's, it's beautiful. So I, I'm on the same page with you about um, our perceptions of space and time being essentially the result of a filter that's, that's, or a projection. Absolutely. And in, in terms of, and, and by the way, that's precisely what I'm working on right now in a paper that we just submitted for publication. We have um, some steps on that where we actually show precisely the, the kind of filtering that leads to space time from a model of consciousness. And a paper I'm working on uh, getting ready to, to, to write right now is going into to more detail about exactly how that filter works that will, will create space and time. And, and that paper is going to be tapping into the amplitudehedron and the decorated permutations idea. But your, your question is a very, very good and, and deep one about what, what faculty are we using to do this work beyond, beyond space time? It, it, so it's a complicated issue. So I'll, I'll take little pieces of it first. The first thing is that the physicists who are doing this work beyond space time always know that whatever structures they propose beyond space time, they have to show how they project into space time where we can test them. So, so you, you, you're not free to just postulate anything you want out there and have fun. Have fun, but eventually you have to show exactly how space and time and particles and their dynamics arise from this structure beyond space-time. If you can't do that, you're not doing science. So we absolutely can only test things inside space and time, like at, at the collider and so forth. And so any theory of what's beyond space-time has to have a precise mathematical projection into space-time, into you know, Einstein's relativistic uh, sp- uh, space-time, for example, uh, quantum field theory and, and so forth. Or, and, and ultimately, Einstein's curved space-time, you know, gravity. Now, the structures that they're what the faculty that the physicists are using right now, the first one I'll, use, I'll talk about is mathematics, right? So what they've done is they say, okay, we have all these hints. That they, what, they, what they found were the, when they did the mathematics in space-time, there were these complicated things, but every once in a while, they would find a formula Someone would just discover a formula. Some some math- mathematician. Would, By the way, you could do it so. You can, now you can do this real easy. You don't need hundreds of pages. Here's a simple formula. I remember looking. Holy smoke! Where did that come from? Right. It was like a hint. It was a a mathematical hint that there's some other way of thinking about this whole thing. There's these guys, Park and Taylor. There's a Park Taylor formula that came out 30, 40 years ago, and everybody, goes, whoa, is that a one off? Or you know, is, or were they just lucky? Uh, and, and it turned out we got lucky over and over again. And, and finally, the, so what the mathematicians and the physicists did was, well, can we posit some structure beyond space-time that would project to space-time and give us these formulas? And so you can see what they're doing. They're, they're, we're getting all these hints. And, well, okay, so now I have to make this creative leap. Okay, there's this structure. I'm letting go of space-time. I'm letting go of quantum theory. I'm doing this geometric object. It's, it's not a polytope, but it's like a polytope. So they postulate it. And could it ever be more than that, Don? Could it, could it ever be more than a well-informed inference? Uh, t- tested in our interface of, of time and space, but not actually experienced? Or could, could it be more than an inference? I think I think it eventually will. I think it eventually will be the source of new technology. So, so for example, right right now, uh, if you and I want to go to the Andromeda galaxy, which is the closest galaxy, it's it's two point four million light years away. Well, we're not going to make it in our lifetime, and 
our great great grandkids won't make it either in their lifetime. So so we can't even get to the nearest galaxy going through space time. But what if um, we realize that space time is just our headset? It's just a data structure. It's not the reality. And we discover this the the first layer of quote unquote software outside of the that headset. Namely, the amplitude heater, for example, and decorated permutations. Why shouldn't we be able to get new technologies where we don't go through space time, we go around space time? Then all of a sudden, what's going to happen is we'll, our addiction to space time, the limits that we have right now in our thinking, most of us, when, when I say there's something beyond space time, I, you know, I've had scientists go, what, what could you possibly even mean? I think the next generation that is spending all their time in VR and the metaverse and so forth and is taking off a headset all the time, for them is going to be, oh, yeah, space time is just a headset. Of course, there's a reality beyond the headset. And of course, we can grok realities beyond space time in our imagination. We just have to expand our minds. And, and, and so we'll be able to do that. We have the tools of mathematics to help us when our current senses sort of falter. But then I think we'll get an expanded sense. And then I think that we will get new, absolutely new technologies. And uh, I should say that I'm right now working on a mathematical model of a dynamics of consciousness. And by the way, again, I agree with Rupert that ultimately my model is just a model. It's not the final reality, right? It's just the next baby step. Ultimately, the one consciousness cannot be described. And yet we're rewarded for humble baby steps of description where we recognize that our description is not the thing and yet it's not pointless either. And so that's that's the interesting thing to say. It, it's not the final word and yet it's not pointless and that's what's really interesting. And but but so this next baby step that I'm taking with my with my team um, is a dynamics a Markovian dynamics of conscious agents that turns out it does it so, and we can talk about if you're interested that why why Markovian and so forth. But it is a dynamics, and it is true what Rupert was saying with this dynamics that we can have a dynamics of Markovian dynamics that's timeless in the sense that there's no increasing entropy, there's no entropic arrow of time in this dynamics of consciousness. But it's a theorem that if you take a projection, and that's exactly the word that that Rupert used when you when you take a, a mathematical projection of this dynamics that's timeless, you will get, and so you project the dynamics into a, a new dynamics, which is a projection of the deeper dynamics. Then you do get an arrow of time. It's a theorem that you get an arrow of time, not as an insight into the nature of the reality, but merely as an artifact of the very projection process itself. And what I'm working on right now is to show not only that the arrow of time arises as an artifact, precisely and mathematically, but also that space itself. That's that's my current project is to show how space itself arises as an artifact. So I couldn't agree with, with Rupert Moore and his term projection is in fact, the right technical projection, uh, the right technical term to use. I'm looking at mathematical projections and showing how time and hopefully eventually space arise as an artifact, not as an insight. And from my point of view, I mean, I, I do a lot of work on evolution but natural selection. I've got, I've got some work showing that evolution also agrees that space-time is not fundamental. I use evolutionary game theory. But this deeper structure, this deeper dynamics, has no arrow of time. The arrow of time, the, the time is the fundamental limited resource in evolution, if you think about it. But it that's the fundamental thing that's the, the limiting factor. The, all the other resource limitations are a result of that. So what I'm saying is that even evolution of natural selection, which is a, I love that theory. It's a beautiful theory. We have no, right now we have no better theory for understanding um, the human mind. I'll put it that way. Not, not, the, not the ultimate consciousness, but the human mind in its projected form. There's no better, uh, the human ego. If you want to understand the human ego scientifically, evolution of natural selection is the, the, is the tool to use. It's incredibly powerful. But it's not the final word. It's not the final theory. There's a deeper theory in which there is no limited resource. There is no, no arrow of time. Perhaps there is no competition, no nature, red and tooth and claw. But when you project that down into a space-time interface, then you get the illusion of ego, me versus you, of nature, red and tooth and claw, of limited resources and competition. And, and so it's all an illusion. So, so what Rupert was saying, um, from a spiritual insight 
is, I think, going to be borne out with mathematical precision in the next baby step. Not the again. No, I don't have a theory of everything. We'll never have a theory of everything, and yet we're rewarded for taking the next baby step. 